in this session we will be discussing about introduction to stretching and flexibility. Flexibility according to Zaka Zuski, flexibility he is defined as ability of the muscle to lengthen allowing one joint or more than one joint in a series to move through a range of motion. According to Holland in 1968, flexibility is characterized by ability of the muscle to relax and yield a stretch force and also the range of motion available in a joint or a group of joints. From this definition we can understand that flexibility of a muscle is mainly it is the away it is the it allows the muscle to move through its range of motion completely. According to Holt 1996 flexibility is the intrinsic property of the body tissue which determines the range of motion achievable without injury at joint or a group of joint. So, Holt he gives importance that flexibility is the range of motion available but it should be without injury. Another definition for flexibility is that flexibility is the ability to move a single joint or a series of joints smoothly and easily through an unrestricted pain free range of motion. Now, there are two types of flexibility. These are dynamic flexibility and static flexibility. Now, what is the difference between dynamic flexibility and static flexibility? There are two types of flexibility is available. The first one is static flexibility and the second one is dynamic flexibility. By the name itself we can understand dynamic flexibility is the flexibility during movement and static flexibility is the static flexibility while uh, uh, do, do at, at any joint without doing any activity if we are not doing any activity. So, dynamic flexibility is the ability to attain a maximum range of motion of the joint while performing movements. This is the flexibility exhibited by while walking, running or participating in a physical activity. Now, the next type of flexibility is the static flexibility. Static flexibility is a linear or angular measurement of actual range of motion in a joint or a complex of joints. So, static flexibility again it, it may be an active flexibility or a passive flexibility. Usually an active passive flexibility is more when compared to active flexibility. Now, which are the structure, which are the things what determines flexibility? The first thing is that first factor which determine flexibility is the joint structure that is joints vary in direction and range of motion. Once we compare different joints you see the shoulder joint it is more more movement will be available. Once you go to the go to the uh, knee joint less movement is available. So, what is the position what is the orientation of the joint what is the position of the joint is joint capsule how much tight the joint capsule and how much uh, how much stability gives the, uh, the joint capsule give. These are the first factor which determines the flexibility. So, structure of the joint and joint capsule. Joint capsule semi these are semi elastic structures that gives the joint strength and stability and limit the moment. So, a, 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 a joint which is having a tight joint capsule will be having less flexibility. A joint which is having more uh, that is loose joint capsule. So, it will be having more flexibility. The second factor which determine flexibility is the muscles elasticity and length. There are different types of uh, structures fibers which is present in the muscle. These are collagen, elastin, titin etcetera. Now, there is collagen fibers are there. These are white fibers. These are the which provide structure and support. There are elastin fibers. These are yellow fibers. These are elastic and flexible and titan these are the filaments with elastic properties. Depends upon how much percentage of the these structure these fibers are the again the elasticity changes. 
then muscle length how much is the length of the muscle it also this also contribute to the flexibility next is bone structure that is depends upon what type of bone what type of joint it is either whether what type of joint consider shoulder joint and knee joint shoulder joint is more mobile than knee joint it is due to the difference in the bone structure next is next factor which determine flexibility is elasticity of the skin that is elastic skin if the skin is much elastic flexibility will be more next is next factor which determine flexibility is the gender it has been proved that women are uh, women are more flexible than men next factor which determine flexibility is the age so young kids the kids are more flexible than older individuals that is as the age increases the flexibility keeps on decreasing so it's having a negative uh, relationship with the uh, age and uh, age and flexibility there is a negative relationship can be seen then next is the physical activity as if the person is doing what type of physical activity is doing depends upon the flexibility varies a person who is doing a lots of stretching exercise regularly he will be more flexible but once a person is doing it has been proved that if a person doing a weight training exercise more and is having a bulk of muscle mass flexibility will be less in that cases so physical activity if he is doing what type of physical activity is doing and it, it the flexibility varies now aging it decreases the joint range of motion so again as age increases flexibility decreases now what are the benefits of this flexibility usually stretching exercise is used to do is used to be done uh, to improve the flexibility what are the benefits of flexibility the first and the most important thing is that it prevent and decrease the incidence of injury there are lots of studies have done in this matter regarding the relationship between uh, flexibility and incidence of injury actually the muscles work like as a shock absorbing mechanism like a shock absorber in a car how it works almost same type of work is will be done by the muscles and it absorb the shock the muscle shock absorb the shock and decreases the chance of injury lots of studies have done among the different types of players and a person who is having flexibility will be having less chance of injury and less flexible people will be having more chance of injury so there is a negative correlation between the the flexibility and there, there is a positive correlation between flexibility and lack of injury so as the flexibility decreases there will be more chance of injury next one is enhance muscle performance again lots of studies n number of studies have been done regarding the perf muscle performance and performance and flexibility as the flexibility increases there will be a better functional performance better performance so it is postulated that all the players should be have, do the proper stretching and flexibility exercise so that that uh, there will be better performance now the next is reduction of post exercise muscle soreness known as delayed onset muscle soreness or doms so usually just after there are two types of muscle soreness can be seen one type of muscle soreness is just after exercise it is almost like a myocardial infarction where it occurs that is uh, it is just uh, type a type of ischemia where the uh, where the where the blood supply to the muscle will be less or that won't be enough which cause which is causing a soreness this is just after this is acute soreness seen just after an exercise but there are some type of soreness which starts after one day that is after 24 hour of exercise and it keep on decreasing till 48 hour from 48 hour it keeps on decreasing so 24 hour 24th hour the pain starts after exercise after a strenuous activity and the pain keeps on increasing till 48 hour and 48 hour onwards it keeps on decreasing and it subsides by 70 70 72 hours so this type of muscle soreness is called delayed onset muscle soreness or doms and it has been proved that if the person is having enough flexibility 
if he is including the stretching exercise during warm up and regular exercise there is less chance of flexibility less chance of um, delayed onset muscle soreness in this type of people now it improves the body position and strength for sports now enough flexibility is important the proper flexibility is important for good posture and balance so if there is any decrease in the flexibility there will be chance of changes in the posture chances of decrease there is some changes in the balance so proper proper good posture and a proper balance flexibility is very very much important now once we uh, tell about flexibility when we see we discuss about the flexibility and mobility of a muscle or a joint there are two terms it usually comes to our mind these are hypermobility and hypomobility what is hypermobility what is hypomobility hypomobility refers a decrease in mobility or a restricted motion if the joint or a muscle there is a decrease in motion or a restricted motion we can call it as hypomobility then what is hypermobility by the name itself we can understand that hypermobility is the increased range of motion that is if the range of motion is beyond the the limit or beyond the normal it is considered as hypermobility now which are the factors which causes restriction of motion which are the factors which causes hypermobility it may be the first and the most important cause for decreased that is restricted motion is prolonged immobilization the causes for prolonged immobilization may be different it may be an extrinsic cause and or an intrinsic cause for example a a person who is in after a fracture after a osteotomy or after any repair or surgery he is in plaster cast or he is in splint or he is in a skeletal traction after these procedures or after a fracture after reduction of fracture this this type of extrinsic factors are the which causes restriction of motion so prolonging immobilization causes a restriction of motion the prolong the causes of prolonged immobilization may be an extrinsic factor or an intrinsic factor extrinsic factor means outside from the body that is after a fracture after a osteotomy after any trauma after any injury after reduction or after along with the treatment you are putting a plaster cast or you are putting a splint or you are putting a traction this causes a prolonged immobilization and later leads to a restricted motion the factors which causing the prolonged immobilization may be an intrinsic factor the first factor worst intrinsic factor is the pain itself for example if there is any degenerative disease like osteoarthritis or any micro trauma or any trauma to the joint so because of the pain you won't move your joint and later leads to it may there may be immobilization and later leads to a restricted mobility another another example is after a joint disease or a joint trauma again you are keeping <coughs> there is a joint inflammation on effusion and there is immobilization this also leads to uh, prolonged immobilization later leads to restriction of motion or in case of any joint inflammation or uh, in case of any muscle tendon or facial disorders disorders of the muscle or tendon or a disorders of fascia like a fasciitis or tendinitis or myositis this also leads to a restricted motion due to prolonged immobilization another example is for prolonged immobilization is any skin disorders may be a burn or a skin graft or scleroderma or a derma in this condition you keep your in the most of this condition there will be chance of a prolonged immobilization and later leads to a uh, it causes a restricted motion now after there is an osteophytes or there is an ankylosis spondylitis or any surgical fusion as done this type of bony block also causes prolonged immobilization of the muscle later leads to restricted motion 
in again a peripheral lymphedema any vascular disorders also leads to a prolonged immobilization later leads to restricted motion now the second cause is a sedentary lifestyle or a habitual faulty or asymmetrical postures for example a person is confined to bed or a wheelchair or a any occupation who is do, who is doing a prolonged sitting or prolonged lying position or any work environment as such a sedentary lifestyle there is this there will be chance of restricted motion now the third cause is for example any neuromuscular disorders is there for example it may be a central nervous system disorder or a peripheral nervous system disorder dysfunction this causes this type of neuromuscular disorders which may cause either spasticity or a rigidity or a flaccidity or a weakness or even a spasm this causes what is happening there will be chance of paralysis there may be tonal abnormalities there may be muscle imbalance and this also leads to a restricted range of motion now there are some disease then some postural mal alignment it may be congenital mal alignment or a acquired one example is scoliosis kyphosis lordosis this also leads to a restricted range of motion so these are the what we were discussing was the factors which contribute the restricted range of motion next is next side heading is contracture contracture can be defined as an adaptive shortening of the muscle tendon unit and other soft tissue that crosses or surround a joint that result in a significant resist resistance to passive or active stretch and may limit the range of motion which may be compromise the functional abilities this is the exact definition of contracture it's an adaptive shortening adaptive shortening and so that it restrict the motion range of motion and compromise the functional abilities is known as contracture now there are different types of contracture it may be a myostatic contracture it may be a pseudo myostatic contracture it may be an arthrogenic or periarticular contracture it may be fibrotic and irreversible contracture what is myostatic contracture here what is happening is that there will be a reduction in the number of sarcomere unit in a series so there is no decrease in the individual sarcomere length but there is there is a there is no significant loss of range of motion so this is called myostatic contracture next type of contracture is the pseudo myostatic it give right what is happening is that there will be change in the tone of the muscle it seems like a myostatic contracture but there is no myostatic actually there is a change in the tone like seen hypertonicity associated with cns lesion like cva spinal cord injury traumatic brain injury so it there will be a pseudo myostatic there is no contracture is there but there is a hypertonicity is there and muscle spasm or guarding may also there now arthrogenic and periarticular contractures any intraarticular pathology like due to any intraarticular pathology or adhesion synovial proliferation joint effusion or irregularities in the articular cartilage or any osteophytic formation osteophytic formation this may cause a contracture in the uh, in the joint or around the muscle around the joint this is called arthrogenic contracture and periarticular contracture means when a connective tissue that crosses and attach the joint restrict the motion it is known as periarticular contracture now next is fibrotic contracture that is due to the any fibrotic changes in the connective tissue of the muscle and periarticular structure this is called fibrotic contracture that is muscle become muscle the uh, tissue elastic tissue is will be may be converted into a fibrotic tissue this is called fibrotic contracture now we discussed mobility or proper flexibility is important why it is important is that it improves the performance it decrease the chance of injury and there are lots of other benefits of the proper mobility so there are lots of techniques which improves the mobility so the most and the important stretch uh, technique is the stretching there is other neuromuscular facilitation techniques are there 
there are muscle energy techniques are there there are joint mobilization and manipulation these are the other techniques to improve the flexibility now among all these techniques the first and the foremost is the most important technique is the stretching so what are the indication for the use of stretching when we can use stretching stretching can be used there are certain conditions if the range of motion is limited because of soft tissue have lost their extensibility as a result of adhesion or a contracture or a scar tissue formation causing functional limitation or disabilities this is the first indication for stretching so range of motion might have limited because of this contracture because of this adhesion or due to a scar tissue formation and this causes a functional limitation so you can go for stretching now if the restricted motion first of all there is a there may be a chance of functional limitation or disability or if the restricted motion may lead to a structural deformities this in this case if you are feeling that stretching can prevent this uh, this structural uh, uh, deformities you can go for stretching techniques now usually if there is a muscle weakness and there will be chance of a shortening of the opposite muscle for example if the extensors of the wrist are weak the flexors may get contracted and my hand will be in this position so in the one muscle weakness causes opposite muscle to be tightened or shortened so in this condition you can go for stretching techniques so a muscle weakness which causing a shortening of the opposing muscle tissue you can go for stretching now we already discussed that stretching uh, that flexibility is having lots of benefits like it decreases the chance of injury it improves the performance etc like a shock absorbing mechanism in a car it improve it uh, decreases the chance of injury so you can add stretching techniques in regular fitness program for the prevention of especially among the players for the prevention of injuries so it can be used as a part of total fitness program designed to prevent the musculoskeletal injuries now it may be used prior to and after vigorous exercise potentially to minimize post exercise muscle soreness that was another benefit we already discussed because of stretching that it de decreases the chance of domes or post exercise muscle soreness so you can give for before give, doing a vigorous exercise program before doing a vigorous uh, vigorous training program you go you can go for you can uh, go for a stretching session or along in the along with the warm up session so that it can prevent the post exercise muscle soreness and dopes also now what are the contra indications so we discussed the indications of stretching so there are some contra indications to the stretching for example if any bony block is there if any bony block is there which limits the range of motion so there is no benefit to stretching you should not go for stretching because stretching does not have any benefit there now another condition there is a recent fracture and proper bony union is not done yet so there was a recent fracture and there is no proper bony union is not there bony union is incomplete do not go for stretching it is a contra indication for stretching so this has to be in this case we have to avoid stretching now next is if there is an inflammatory an acute inflammatory process is there there is heat is there there is swelling is there or soft tissue healing so there will be a healing process also so if you are doing this uh, stretching to these structures after during an acute inflammation or acute inflammation what will happen is that it will decrease the chance of healing now once you have started your stretching techniques you feel that there is a severe pain sharp acute pain starts with the joint movement or muscle elongation you should stop stretching it's a contra indication now there is a hematoma is there 
or other any indications of tissue trauma is there, you should not go for stretching. If already a hypo, hyper mobility is there, if already a hyper mobility exists, you should not go for stretching. And if the so short and soft tissue provide necessary joint stability, for example, in case of uh, in case of in certain uh, conditions where there is a shortened tissue may can give a better stability or a better neuromuscular control. In that case, you should not go for stretching. Now, a person with paralysis and weakness, this short, short and soft tissue enables a patient with paralysis or severe muscle weakness to perform certain functional skill. Otherwise, it is not possible in that condition. You should not go for stretching and you should not uh, you should not do stretching in this condition. So, these are the contraindications for stretching. Now, there is another term called selective stretching. Now, here in selective stretching means you are going to apply stretching selectively to a selective muscle group. For example, you are allowing the limitation of the motion of fingers flexors. For example, your finger flexor is, uh, is there is a limitation of the motion of the finger flexor in a paralyzed patient and or in a spinal cord injury patient. You can leave that fl finger flexors and you can go for wrist stretching. So, the selective stretching means it is the process whereby overall function of a patient may be improved by applying stretching techniques selectively to some muscles and joints, but allowing the limitation of motion to other joints, so that we can do some functional activities. So, selective stretching means we are stretching selectively to certain muscles. Now, hypermobility, the next term we are going to define is the hypermobility. Hypermobility means there is an increased mobility. The, the, the joint movement and the muscular movement is increased. This condition is, this is known as hypermobility. Now, we will go through the different types of stretching techniques. Stretch, there are different types of stretch, stretching techniques are available. The first one is static stretching. Next is cyclic or intermittent stretching. If you are keeping stretching for a prolonged period of time, it is, this is known as static stretching. Next type of stretching is the cyclic or intermittent stretching. Here in this case, we are stretching for a shorter period of time and you are removing the, the stretching force, again you are giving the stretching. This is called cyclic stretching or intermittent stretching. Third type of stretching is the ballistic stretching. Ballistic stretching means you are giving a fast stretching force and you are removing the force. This is known as ba uh, ballistic type of stretching. Next type of stretching is the PNF stretching. That is, here we are including the PNF, that is proprioceptive neuro facilita neuromuscular facilitation stretching program. You are in incorporating the program, this, this functional movements. We can say a functional movement along with the stretching. Then next one is the manual stretching. Here we are using the manual force, manual force for the stretching techniques. And next one is the mechanical stretching. Here, manual stretching means you are using the, the trainer or therapist go, do, does, his, does the stretching. Then the mechanical stretching, we are using any mechanical instruments. We are incorporating any instrument for stretching that is considered, that is known as mechanical stretching. Now, the next type of stretching is the self-stretching. Self-stretching means the, stretch, the person stretch himself. That is by using, that is him, the, if the person stretches himself, this is known as self-stretching. Now, the other type of stretching is active stretching and passive stretching. Passive stretching, we can say it as a manual stretching or a mechanical stretching and active stretching it can be, it is a, it is, uh, it is actually a self-stretching technique. Now, what are the determinants of stretching intervention? First one is alignment. That is, the, the alignment of the limb is important. That is, alignment with the positioning a limb or a body such that stretch force is directed to the appropriate muscle group. This is called alignment. 
Next one is the stabilization. Stabilization means the fixation of one side of because one side of attachment of the muscle as the stretch force is applied to the other bony attachment. So, usually a muscle will be having two attachments that is a proximal and a distal attachment. Here you are stabilizing or fixing one part of attachment and you are moving the other attachment. This is called stabilization. So, so that the proper stretching can be done. Next one is the intensity of stretch. That is intensity of the stretch means how much magnitude the stretch force you are applying. That is whether, uh, uh, whether how much force you are applying and this is this means the intensity of stretch. The next one is duration of the stretch. For how much time you are giving a stretch. That is length of the time the stretch force is applied during a stretch cycle. That is if you are giving for 1 minute, if you are giving it for 10 minutes or if you are giving for 5 minutes, this means the duration of the stretch. Next is the speed of stretch. That is speed of stretch means speed of initial application of the stretch force. The next is the frequency of stretch. That is how many number of stretching session you will be doing per week or per day. This is known as the frequency of stretch. If you are doing it twice or if you are doing it thrice, if you are doing it 10 times, this means that intensity of stretch. Next is the mode of stretch. What type of stretch you are doing? Whether it is a static stretch depends upon the what manner of stretch. That is whether what type of uh, force you are using. That is if you are using what type of stretch force that is whether it is a static whether it is a ballistic, whether it is a cyclic type of force you are using or the degree of patient participation that depends upon patient participation either whether it is a passive stretch, whether it is a active stretch, whether it is a assisted stretch or the source of stretch that is either it is a manual stretch or a mechanical stretch or it is a self stretch. So, these are the determinants of stretching intervention. So, uh, in this session we already discussed about the what is flexibility, what are the importance of flexibility, what are the different, what are the benefits of flexibility, what are what is meant by contracture and what are the indication, contraindication in which condition you can give the stretching. There are some references, you can go through the references. Thank you. Now, we will go through the tracks of the spinal cord. Now, I told you there are two types of tracks are there ascending tracks and descending tracks. The sensory information from the receptors throughout the most of the body is relayed to the brain by means of ascending tracks fibers that conducts the impulses up to the spinal cord. So, from outside the body, the sensory information once it reaches the spinal cord, it passed through this ascending tracks and reaches the brain. When the brain directs the motor activities, these directions the, from the central nervous system or brain, the brain it forms the nerve impulses and travel down to through the spinal cord through the tracks only. So, travels down the spinal uh, through the uh, travel down the spinal cord through the descending tracks. Ascending tracks are the as tracks which carry signals in the spinal cord. Typically three types of neurons are available in the ascending tracks, in the tracks. The first order, there are first order neuron, there are second order neuron, there are third order neuron. First order neuron, it detects the stimulus and carries into the spinal cord. So, first there are first order neuron, it carries, it detects the stimulus and carries into the spinal cord. Second order neuron is seen within the spinal cord. It is continuous to the thalamus, to the sensory, that is thalamus is the sensory relay station. So, second order neuron in the spinal cord carries to the thalamus. Then third order neuron, it carries signals from thalamus to the sensory region of the cerebral cortex. So, once you say the ascending tracks, 
the prefix will be spino. For example, the spinothalamic tract or spinoreticular tracts, spinocerebellar tracts. The tracts which prefix spino means these are the ascending tracts. So, it is having three neurons, a first order neuron that is uh, detect the impulse and carries impulse stimulus and carries to the spinal cord, second order neuron it, can, it is in the spinal cord and it, and it reaches till the thalamus and a third order neuron which carries signal from thalamus to the, to the sensory region of the cerebral cortex. Now, which are the ascending tracts? These are dorsal column tract, dorsal column tract, spinothalamic tract, spinoreticular tract and spinocerebellar tracts are the ascending tracts. So, dorsal column tract, dorsal spinothalamic tract, spinoreticular tract and spinocerebellar tracts are the descending tracts ascending tracts. Then descending tracts are the motor tracts, these are pyramidal tracts, these can be divided into pyramidal tracts and extra pyramidal tracts. Pyramidal tract include lateral corticospinal and anterior corticospinal tract. Then extra pyramidal tract includes rubrospinal tract, reticulospinal tract, olivospinal tract and vestibulospinal tract. So, we were discussing about the ascending tracts. The first ascending tract is the dorsal column tract. Dorsal column tract is a tract which, uh, which carries sensations related to the discriminative touch, visceral pain, vibration and proprioception. Discriminative touch, visceral pain, vibration and proprioception is carried through dorsal column tract to the brain. Now, it is having again three neurons, the first order neuron. <coughs> first order neuron, it detect the stimulus. There is fasciculus gracilis and fasciculus cuneatus is there. Fasciculus gracilis carries sensation from below T6 and Fasciculus cuneatus carries sensation from T6 or higher level. And there is second order neuron, it synapses with the first order neuron in the medulla and its deposits. Then the third order it travels up and the third order neuron synapses with the second order neuron at the thalamus and carries signals to the cerebral cortex that is at the post central gyrus. The system it is a contralateral system. So, the, this is the co dorsal column tract. It is a tract which uh, carries sensation of discriminative touch, visceral pain, proprioception and vibration. Next type of ascending tract is the spinothalamic tract or spinothalamic pathway. Now, spinothalamic pathway is the pathway or tract which carries sensation of pain, pressure, temperature, light touch, tickle and itch. It is located in the anterior and lateral columns. Then deposition of the second order neuron occurs in the spinal cord and third order neuron arise again at the thalamus level and continue to the cerebral cortex of the post central gyrus. So, second the ascending tract is the spinothalamic tract. Next there is we have the spinoreticular tract, especially it carries the pain signal from, uh, from a tissue injury site. So, the deposit in the spinal cord and ascend uh, as with the spinothalamic fibers and end with reticular formation. Third and fourth new order neurons are the it continue to the thalamus and cerebral cortex. So, there are spinal fourth, third and fourth order neurons are present in the spinoreticular tract. Next ascending tract is the spinocerebellar tract. In the spinocerebellar tract, the first order neuron originate in the muscles and tendon. In the second order neuron ascend in the ipsilateral, ipsilateral lateral column and it terminate in the cerebellum <coughs> and it transmit proprioceptive signals from the limbs and the trunk. 
So, spinocerebellar tracts to tra for the transmission of proprioceptive signals from the limbs and trunk. So, these were the ascending tracts or the sensory tracts. Now, there are descending tracts especially motor tracts. So, there are two types of descending tracts are there. These are a direct pathway and indirect pathway. Direct pathway that is called pyramidal tract and indirect pathway it is called extra pyramidal tract. Now, this motor pathway or descending tracts include two types of neuron. There is upper motor neuron and the lower motor neuron. Upper motor neuron begins with the, begins with the soma in the cerebral cortex or brainstem and lower motor neuron uh, that is in the soma in the anterior horn axon leads to the muscle. Now, we, we can divide the uh, we can divide it the tracks into two types the descending tracks into two types that is pyramidal tracks or pyramidal system. It is also called corticospinal tracks and an extra pyramidal system. Now, we will discuss about the pyramidal system or corticospinal tract. These are the direct system, direct pathways which originate from the pyramidal neurons in the percentile gyri in the, in the brain. Now, pyramidal neuron is in upper motor neuron, is in the upper motor neuron and it forms the corticospinal tracts. The upper motor neuron synapses in the anterior horn with the lower motor neuron. Then this lower motor neuron activate the skeletal muscles. The direct pathway, this direct pathway regulate fast and fine skill movements. That is, this fast movement and skilled movement is directed by the, the, the direct, the pyramidal tract. Now, lat there are two types of pyramidal tracts are there, there are two parts are there. There is a lateral corticospinal tract and anterior corticospinal tract. In lateral corticospinal tract, upper motor, nerve, upper motor neuron deposits in the pyramids of the medulla and in the anterior corticospinal tract, upper motor neuron deposits at the spinal cord at the spinal cord level. Now, there are some, some other descending system other than the pyramidal system. This is these are called extra pyramidal system. Now, its upper motor neuron originates in nuclei deep in the cerebrum and upper motor neuron does not pass through the pyramids and lower motor neuron is in the anterior horn of the motor neuron. It is at the uh, lower motor neuron is an anterior horn motor neuron and this system includes the indirect system or extra pyramidal system includes rubrospinal tract, vestibulospinal tract, reticulospinal tract and tectospinal tract. So, <clears throat> these are not like pyramidal system this in the extra pyramidal system is multisynaptic. Now, the different extra pyramidal system we already uh, named it tectospinal tract, reticulospinal tract, vestibulospinal tracts and rubrospinal tract. Tectospinal tract the reflux it is the, it produces the reflux turning of the head in response to the sight and sound. Reticulospinal tract dysfunction is it controls the limb movement. Important to maintain the post it is so it is important to maintain the posture and balance. So, reticular uh, spinal tract controls the limb movements. So, it is important to maintain the posture and balance. Next is the vestibulospinal tract that is uh, especially its main function is postural muscle activity uh, that is controlled. And rubrospinal tract it originates from the red nucleus of the midbrain and it controls the flexor muscles. Now, we will be discussing about the spinal nerves. So, we already discussed is that spinal nerve is a part of the peripheral nervous system. There are 31 pairs of the spinal nerve that is 8 at the cervical level, 12 at the thoracic level, 5 at lumbar level, 5 at sacral level and 1 at coccygeal level. Now, how the spinal nerves are formed? It is for each spinal nerve is formed by the union of the anterior and posterior roots in the intervertebral foramen. Now, the anterior root it contain the motor fibers for the skeletal muscle. Those from the those from the T1 to T, T 
So anterior root, it contains the motor fibers for the skeletal muscle. Those from T1 to L2 contain sympathetic fibers, S2 and S4 contain parasympathetic fibers. Posterior root contain the sensory fibers whose cell bodies are in the spinal ganglia. So, it is formed from the posterior and anterior root. The spinal nerves are formed from anterior and posterior root. Now, once we see the functional component, we can see there are four functional components are there for the spinal nerves. There is a somatic efferent nerve fiber is there. There is a visceral efferent nerve fiber is there. Somatic efferent nerve fiber, afferent nerve fiber is there and visceral afferent nerve fiber is there. Somatic efferent nerve fiber is the fibers that transmit motor impulse from spinal cord to the skeletal muscle. Visceral efferent nerve fiber is fiber that transport that trans or transmit the motor impulse from spinal cord to the smooth muscle, cardiac muscle or glands. These are the visceral efferent nerve fiber. So, afferent is just opposite of that. That is somatic afferent nerve fiber means the fibers that transmit uh, uh, fr that transmit extraceptive and proprioceptive impulse that is sensory impulse from body to the spinal cord. Visceral means the fibers that transmit impulses from viscera to the spinal cord. So, functionally it is having four components, if the functionally a spinal nerve is having four components, these are the somatic efferent, visceral efferent, somatic afferent, visceral afferent. Now, what is a nerve plexus? We might have heard lots of regarding the nerve plexus like brachial plexus, like lumbar plexus, like cervical plexus. What is the, what is meant by nerve plexus? It is a complex interwoven network of a nerve. It is called nerve plexus. Three large plexus are seen at the body. These are cervical plexus, brachial plexus and lumbosacral plexus. The lumbosacral plexus can be further divided into lumbar plexus, sacral plexus. So, nerve plexus means plex, uh, this is a complex or there is a complex interwoven nerves. So, mainly three types of plexus are seen in the body cervical plexus, brachial plexus and lumbosacral plexus. Now, we might have heard upper neuron, upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron. What is upper motor neuron or lower motor neuron? Upper motor neuron means the motor neurons that originate from the motor region of the cerebral cortex or brain stem and carry the motor information down to the final common pathway. That is any motor neuron that are not directly responsible for region, uh, 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 stimulating the targeting muscle is known as upper motor neuron. And the, 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 the motor neuron which directly responsible for stimulating the target muscle is known as lower motor neuron. So, that is the difference between upper and lower motor neuron. Lower motor neuron means the motor neuron connecting the brainstem and spinal cord to the muscle fiber, bringing the nerve impulses from upper motor neuron to the muscle or from the to the muscle to the uh, central nervous system. A motor neuron, a lower motor neuron axon terminates at the muscle. So, a motor neuron's axon terminates at the muscle, it is called lower motor neuron and uh, which is not in contact with the effector muscle, it is called upper motor neuron. Now, what is a motor unit? Motor unit can be defined as a single motor neuron and the group of muscle that muscle fibers it is innervated. So, all muscle fiber is in a single motor unit consist of the same muscle fiber type. Now, a muscle fi a single motor neuron and the muscle fibers supplied by the uh, by this motor neuron is considered as a motor unit. Now, we discussed about the spinal cord, it is having lots of functions. So, there are lots of tracts passing through the spinal cord. So, it is having both motor and sensory tracts are passing through. What will happen once the spinal cord may get injured? Usually, the spinal cord may get damaged usually during a, any trauma or any diseases or road even during road traffic accidents. So, spinal cord injury is damaged the uh, causes damage to the spinal cord 
and which result in loss of function of the spinal cord. So, both motor and chance so there is may be chance of motor and sensory function may get affected. So, the frequent causes are the trauma and diseases. So, that spinal cord may get damaged, it causes loss of function, uh, loss of function completely and partially that is both sensory and motor function may get affected because both motor and sensory pathway passes through the spinal cord. Now, what are the different types of spinal cord paralysis? Depending upon the location and extent of injury, the different forms of paralysis can occur. That is once there is motor, uh, once there is a spinal cord injury, sometimes it may cause paralysis. So, what, where is the, uh, how much type, how much injury is there? How much, what is the location of the injury? Then the paralysis may differ. Monoplegia means paralysis of one limb. Diplegia means paralysis of both upper or both or lower limbs. Paraplegia means paralysis of both lower limb. Hemiplegia means paralysis of upper limb, dorsal and lower limb of the one side of the body. So, if the paralysis on one side of the body is called hemiplegia. Quadriplegia means paralysis of all four limbs. Now, what will happen? What each will go through? What will happen if there is spinal cord injury at each level? If the injury is at the cervical level, at C1, between C1 and C3, all daily functions, all daily activities must be totally assisted. Breathing will be dependent on ventilator, motorized wheelchair controlled by sip and puff or chin movement is required at this stage. Now, if the injury, if the spinal cord injury at is at C4 level, the all the things, all the uh, all the conditions will be almost same as that of C1 and C3, but breathing gets spared. That is, breathing can be done without a ventilator. Now, if the paralysis it at such C5 level, there will be proper good heck, uh, head and neck shoulder movements as well as elbow flexion, but still electrical wheelchair is required for and short distance with the support of some person he can move, movement can be done. Now, if it is at C6 level, wrist flexion, wrist extension movement will be good, uh, but assistance needed for dressing transition of the bed to the chair or car may be needed assistance. If C7 and C8 level is at the C7 and C8, all the hand movement will get spread, all the hand movement will get, uh, all uh, will get the all hand movements and ability to dress, eat, drive, do transfer and do upper body washes. Now, if the paralysis at, at the thoracic level, that is even if at T1 and to T4, normal communication skills may be there, help only may be only be needed for heavy, heavy uh, that is loading wheelchair into a car, etc. If it is T5 to T9, manual wheelchair can be done for everyday daily living and independent for personal care. And if it is at T10 to L1, partial paralysis of the lower body will be there. If it is between L2 and S5, some knee, hip and foot movements with possible slow difficult walking with the assistance or aids. Only heavy home maintenance and hard cleaning will need assistance. Now, now, the spinal cord injury, these are, these we were discussing about the uh, complete injuries, complete cut. Spinal cord injury may be uh, complete or incomplete. So, spinal cord syndrome can be classified either a complete or incomplete categories. Complete is characterized by complete loss of motor and sensory function below the level of traumatic lesion. Incomplete is characterized by different neurological findings that is partial loss of sensor, 
partial loss of motor function below the lesion. So, injury may be the spinal cord injury may be partial or uh, complete. So, complete means all the motor function and sensory function will be below the level get affected, but incomplete some uh, functions will, get, will be spared and this there will be partial loss of sensory or motor functions. Now, central so will partial lesion, we will go through some partial lesion. So, so, first one is a central cord lesion usually involves in the cervical region. It usually result from the cervical hyper extension causing an ischemic injury to the central part of the cord. So, central part of the cord get affected. So, there will be motor weakness is present in the upper limb than lower limb. So, this as the central cord is get affected, in the central cord syndrome, there will be motor weakness will be more in the upper limb than the lower limb. Then, then patient more likely to lose the pain and temperature sensation than the proprioception. Patient may complain of burning feeling in the upper limbs and more commonly seen in older patients with cervical arthritis and narrowing of the spinal cord. So, central cord syndrome means the center part will get affected. So, usually there will be upper limb will be affected than lower limb and uh, patients may complain of burning feeling in the upper limb and they may lose pain and temperature, but since, uh, but uh, proprioception may get spared. Next type of lesion is the brown sequard lesion. In brown sequard lesion, one side of the spinal cord one side, one half of the spinal cord may get affected. That is, it's born, brown saccord syndrome may result from an injury only to, to only half of the spinal cord and is most noticed in cervical region again. Is of, uh, usually a tumor or a trauma or inflammation may cause brown saccord syndrome. So, there will be motor loss is evident on the same side as the injury to the spinal cord. Sensory loss is evident on the opposite side, especially on the opposite side of the location. Then bowel and bladder will be normal. Person is normally able to walk through some bracing or, stab or a stability device may be required. The next one is the anterior spinal cord syndrome. It is usually uh, result from a compression of the artery that runs along in front of the spinal cord. So, compression of the spinal cord may form, uh, uh, may be, may be from a uh, bone fragment or a large his, uh, herniation. Even a bone fragment or a uh, disc herniation may cause compression of the anterior spinal cord syndrome. Patient with anterior spinal cord syndrome have a variable amount of motor function below the level of injury. Depends upon which area, which track is get, which side of the anterior side is get affected. Sensation to the pain and temperature also lo are lost, while the sensitivity to the vibration and proprioception are preserved. So, these are the different types of the spinal cord uh, paralysis, that is spinal cord injury. It may be a partial injury or a complete injury, that is partial injury, uh, that is uh, partial injury is again central cord syndrome is the brown saccord syndrome and anterior spinal cord syndrome. Now, this session we discussed about the anatomy and anatomy of the spinal cord and it is regarding the covering the meninges and it is part of the meninges. We discussed about the spaces and we discussed about the cerebrospinal fluid, how it is formed and how it is circulated and we discussed then we discussed about how the uh, about the anatomy of the spinal cord and regarding the gram matter. Then we discussed about the tracts of the spinal cord including the ascending tracts are there and descending tracts are there. Ascending tracts are the sensory tracts and descending tracts are the motor tracts. Hence, there are spinal nerves are there and nerve plexus are there and that is all.